Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar brought to you by the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. Tonight's topic is the optimum management of open fractures. This is Mark Swinkowski, Editor-in-Chief of JBJS and host for tonight's webinar. Through technology platforms such as this webinar, we are able to provide content that is important, timely, and available in an interactive format in the comfort of your office or home. Whether or not they are trauma specialists, all orthopedists will confront open fractures during their career. These injuries present multiple clinical challenges, including contamination and infection, soft tissue management, and fracture fixation. The tragic uptick in global violence, plus the more mundane mechanisms of falls and work-related and motor vehicle accidents create an urgent need for orthopedists worldwide to stay current on the most effective strategies for managing open fractures. Tonight's webinar is moderated by Dr. Ron Lindsay, Chair of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at the University of Texas Medical Branch and co-editor of JBJS Case Connector. During this webinar, you will hear from two authors who publish papers in JBJS on management of open fractures, Drs. Samir Mehta and Romney Anderson. You will also hear from open fracture experts, Drs. Kenneth Eagle and Michael Bossi, who will share their thoughts on the presentation. Toward the end of the webinar, all experts on the panel will address questions from the audience to provide further insight into tonight's topic. I also want to mention that orthopedic surgeons who are attending this broadcast live will receive an email tomorrow at noon with directions on how to obtain CME credit. Before we get started, I want to make sure you get the most out of this webinar. There are a few ways you can participate in tonight's event. You are welcome to ask one of our panelists a question by simply typing your question in the Ask a Question bar, which you will see below the slides. When you're done, simply press Submit. Feel free to submit a question anytime during the presentation. You can also read our speaker's biographies. In addition, the handout widget at the bottom of your screen contains PDFs of the two articles presented tonight and other JBJS-related articles. Additionally, if you would like to participate in the live Twitter discussion taking place, please use hashtag JBJSWebinar. Finally, the slides from tonight's webinar will be emailed to you tomorrow at noon. Now let me introduce our moderator, Dr. Ron Lindsay. Dr. Lindsay is chair of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at the University of Texas Medical Branch and co-editor of JBJS Case Connector. Doctors, Dr. Lindsay, Lindsay's research has focused on novel tissue engineering methodologies, establishing the extent of strength and functional reduction associated with prominent bone lesions and defects, and determining the inhibitory effects of a variety of traditional therapeutic agents on bone osteogenesis. Ron? Thank you, Dr. Swinkowski, and thank you for the privilege to moderate what I anticipate will be an exciting and informative event. Before we ben begin our presentations, I'd like to make a couple of brief comments regarding open fractures. If you perform a PubMed literature search to the citations for the most common orthopedic emergencies, you'll find that there have been almost as much written about open fractures as all of the others combined. And this should not really be a surprise. Open fractures are common and impact most orthopedic surgeons. The reported annual incidence of all open fractures is about um, 30.7 per 100,000 persons. And in an every fifth night on-call rotation at your average urban or suburban uh, medical facility, the average orthopedic surgeon will see approximately five open long bone fractures annually. Moreover, the reported incidence of these complications for the higher grade long bone open fractures can be quite substantial. Uh, deep infection as high as 36%, delayed or non-union greater than 50%, amputation ranging between 17 and 86%. And if we examine patient satisfaction and functional outcomes, Historically, some authors have suggested that compared to amputation, many of the patients with salvage limbs have a poor quality of life. So tonight we have 
four outstanding speakers who are experts on open fractures. Our first author, Dr. Samir Mehta, is an associate professor in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at the University of Pennsylvania's Perelman School of Medicine and serves as chief of the Orthopedic Trauma and Fracture Service at the University of Pennsylvania. He will present his paper, Does Timing to Operative Debridement Affect Infectious Complications in Open Long Bone Fractures? The second JBJS article, entitled Treatment of Open Proximal Femoral Fractures Sustained in Combat, will be presented by Dr. Romney Anderson. Dr. Anderson served 34 years in the U.S. Army. Most recently, he served as the chairman of the Department of Orthopedics at the Walter Reed National Medical Military Medical Center, and he is currently a professor of surgery at USUHS, the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences. Each author's presentation will be followed by a commentary. Dr. Mehta's paper will be commented on by Dr. Kenneth Egel, who is a professor and the vice chairman of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at NYU Hospital for Joint Diseases, where he established the NYU HJD Fracture Research Group. Dr. Anderson's presentation will be discussed by Dr. Michael Bossi, who is a retired captain in the U.S. Navy Reserves and an orthopedic trauma surgeon and director of orthopedic clinical research at the Carolinas Medical Center. He also serves as chair of the Major Extremity Trauma Research Consortium. We will save the last 15 minutes for questions from the audience. These questions can be sent in at any point during the presentation. Dr. Swinkowski will help me identify the most relevant questions, and I will direct them toward one or all of the speakers. Now, let's begin with Samir Mehta. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be, uh, to be a part of this webinar, um, and I want to thank my co-authors on this publication um, in terms of operative timing uh, affecting uh, complications in open long bone fractures. Really, when we talk about uh, this injury pattern, uh, what we're really talking about, and I some, somewhat say this tongue-in-cheek, is do you need to get out of bed in the middle of the night to manage these injuries? Uh, and what information do we have out there to really answer that question? So we know, as, as Dr. Lindsay said, that this is a really common injury pattern that's frequently seen. Uh, there's a high associated rate of infection uh, in these open fractures. And we also know that there's a high societal cost. Uh, and a lot of the work that Dr. Bossi has done with the LEAP work uh, has attributed uh, and contributed to this as well. In addition, we know that there are certain treatment protocols that have uh, been established that are standard. For instance, uh, administration of antibiotics, early operative debridement and uh, incisional irrigation, and then fracture stabilization. And all of these things clearly have an impact on uh, some of those negative outcomes that we addressed before. The question is, is when is the timing of operative management of these open fractures, when is it ideal? Now, we have the six-hour rule that was started in uh, 1898. It came, it came from Friedrich's work, um, which is in the pre-antibiotic era. Uh, he took guinea pigs and took dirt from his yard and rubbed them in an open wound. Um, but these patients, these patients, these guinea pigs, did not have fractures, and they were not administered antibiotics. And this was back in 1898. And so really, the six-hour rule, um, well, it may be somewhat uh, uh, outdated or an old adage, and we need to revisit this. You know, although expedient debridement of open fractures should be the goal, there are circumstances, even in modern times, where delay may benefit or at least not harm the patient. Some of these delays may be due to the fact that patients present outside of normal hours. They may be in remote environments where geographically they cannot be managed uh, with early uh, debridement and irrigation. Or they may be polytrauma patients where an urgent or emergent trip to the operating room may not be in the best interest of their overall stabilization. The consequences of these delays, however, are unknown in the management of open long bone fractures. Therefore, the purpose of our study was to evaluate the association between time to initial operative debridement 
and the development of infection-related complications following open fractures and long bones. Uh, it was a system, systematic literature review using Medline and PubMed and Cochrane databases for higher level studies with cer specific search headings and terms. Several inclusion criteria were utilized to isolate appropriate articles. We did a meta-analysis with a random effects model looking at several primary analytic endpoints, including the effects of early versus late debridement on infection, as well as a sensitivity analysis looking at specific time cutoffs, the severity of the injury, the anatomic location, deep or superficial infection, and the level of evidence of the paper. Um, we identified several citations, approximately 885, that were eventually whittled down to 16 papers that met our inclusion and exclusion criteria, which resulted in a total of 3,539 open fractures that were part of the analysis. Before I present the data, I want to briefly explain what some of the data slides that we're going to be presenting look like in the anatomy of the forest plot. The horizontal line here represents the data from individual studies. If they fall in the left half, the study favors late debridement. If they fall in the right half, the study favors early debridement. The gray line represents no difference between early and late debridement, and the red line represents the meta-analysis summary statistic. So utilizing that, here you see the plot of the effect of time to initial debridement. And overall, the infection rate in these studies ranged from 0 to 38%, but the odds ratio was 0.93. So there's really no effect or association between a late and early debridement uh, or higher or lower infection rates. We also looked at um, time cutoffs, and there was no difference for early versus late debridement in studies that use 5, 6, 8, or 12 hours as the cutoff. We also looked at the type or the injury severity. So Gastillo Anderson type 1 fractures had an uh, overall infection rate of 7.5%. The odds ratio uh, of infection was 0.58. So again, there was no association found between late debridement and higher infection rates in this subset of patients. Similarly, we examined the higher energy injuries, the Gastillo Anderson type 3 injuries, and in these studies, the overall infection rate was 12.6%, but the odds ratio was only 0.84, again showing no association between late debridement and higher infection rates in this subset of patients. Finally, we looked at some of the additional sensitivity analyses comparing um, studies that provided level 2 versus level 3 evidence, anatomic location, um, lower extremity only data, and depth of infection, including superficial and deep, and again, there were no differences in infection rates according to time to initial debris mod. Obviously, there are several limitations. Um, the, these sort of studies are limited to the primary study data that is included. Um, there is equipoise, and there's potential for future studies in terms of debridement timing and quality of debris mod, and also examining antibiotic timing, the type of antibiotic given, and the duration of antibiotics. In conclusion, there was no association uh, with, uh, with, with higher overall infection rates, higher deep infection rates, or higher infection rates and more severe injuries between late or early debris mock. However, we would encourage people to minimize delays of patients going to the operating room with open fractures. But adherence to an arbitrary time based on this data is not necessary. What we do at our institution is probably similar to what many people do. We give tetanus and antibiotics upon arrival to the trauma bay or to the emergency room. We do an irrigation and removal of gross debris in the ER or the trauma bay. And the patients are taken to the operating room in an expedient fashion with the right surgeon and the right team at the right time. Thank you. Thank you, Samir. Uh, Dr. Egel, what's your perspective on the information just presented? Thanks, Ron. Uh, I'd also like to thank JBGS for inviting me to participate in this very important webinar, and I want to congratulate Dr. Mehta and his team on this important work.
<coughs> the authors uh, performed The authors performed a, uh, a midline M base. I'm having a problem here with the. Uh, the authors performed a midline M base and Cochrane database search using the uh, terms open fracture, open fractures, and debridement. Their, inc their inclusion criteria included studies with a minimum of 26 subjects. All patients needed to be over the age of 18 years. Studies had clinical and radiographic evidence of fracture union at the time of follow-up with evidence of completeness of wound healing and outcomes of infection. Open long bone fractures were included with time to debridement as a metric, and these were all level one, two, or three therapeutic or prognostic studies. Studies were excluded if they did not meet the above inclusion criteria, were not performed on human subjects, did not allow for outcomes of open fractures to be distinguished from outcomes of closed fractures. They classified gunshot wounds as open fractures, or it did not involve long bone fractures. Uh, overall, I felt that the methods were rigorous and valid. They went through uh, 885 citations, and this was weeded down to 16 studies, six of which were prospective and level two, and 10 retrospective level three studies. The time thresholds for debridement in the varying studies differentiated, differentiating early versus late were five hours in two studies, six hours in the majority or nine studies, eight hours in two, 12 hours in one study and not reported in two studies. The effect of delayed debridement on overall infection rates, um, <clears throat> there was a heterogeneous definition of infection between groups, uh, positive intraoperative and wound cultures. Uh, or culture-positive osteomyelitis and non-union. There was also heterogeneous reporting of deep and superficial uh, uh, infections or, or both infection rates in these papers. These authors found no significant difference in the overall infection rate between early and late debridement in, uh, in a, uh, a meta-analysis of all of the data. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the cumulative odds ratio of developing an infection late versus early was 0 0.91, and there were no differences for infection rates detected with the use of any of the uh, time cutoffs, 5, 6, 8, or 12 hours. The severity of infection was also not related to the timing of debridement, the severity of injury, or the anatomic location of the open fracture. Overall, I felt this was a well-designed meta-analysis of level two and three studies, which compared early versus late debridement of open long bone fractures. The authors found no association between later debridement times and higher infection rates. When all infections in these studies were considered, or when only more severe open fracture injuries were considered, there was still no association between timing of debridement. There are some limitations. Obviously, as mentioned earlier, the heterogeneity of infections the definition of wound handling, irrigation practices, antibiotic administration, patient comorbidities, virulence of contaminants, and injury characteristics. Uh, in addition, details of antibiotic administration was not well described, nor were the details of surgical debridement, which we know is an extremely important aspect of management of these injuries. In summary, open fractures in and of themselves do not need operative debridement within six hours, and this study certainly has implications for those who take call and provide care uh, to these uh, uh, patients with these injuries. Okay, um, th Ken, thank you for your commentary. Uh, we have some time before our next presentation is scheduled to begin, so I have a question for Samir and uh, perhaps another one for Ken. Uh, so Samir, you, uh, you uh, reviewed briefly how this paper has uh, maybe um, uh, a change practice in your hospital. What do you think should be the impact of your review on our current uh, clinical practice uh, uh, level three, level two hospitals and the like? Well, I, uh, I think there needs to be, uh, you know, you need to take the patient into consideration. Uh, I don't think the arbitrary six hour rule makes, um, makes a lot of sense. And I think you have to look at the patient look at the wound, look at the circumstances that you're in. Um, you know, I'll use an example from my own institution in the sense that, you know, if it's 10 o'clock at night and I've 
I'm there for whatever reason, and a type 3A open tibia comes in at 10 o'clock at night, I'm, I might stay and do it uh, because we're already there. The team is already there. I have a dedicated team to do it. We also have a dedicated OR the next day, so that case could go first. Uh, I think you have to look at the resources that you have available at your institution. Um, you know, if, if that open tibia doesn't get done in the middle of the night or right when it comes in, is it going to wait till the end of the day the next day? That's probably pushing the envelope. Um, but if it's going to be done in a timely fashion, uh, that may be more appropriate. Who's going to be doing it I think is also important. Um, if you have colleagues that may have an interest in this sort of injury pattern, trauma colleagues or, or people who are trauma fellowship, they may be more inclined or they may want to do these sort of cases. Uh, and so that's also something to take into consideration because they may adjust their schedule the next day to accommodate these patients. So I think all of that has to be juggled um, and managed. And I think it's a very um, geographically specific decision to make. Okay, so Ken, I would uh, put the same question to you. Um, how do you see this uh, review uh, impacting uh, the practice at your facility? Well, I agree with uh, a lot of what Samir uh, just discussed. Um, I would add that, you know, each open fracture is different, okay? You have an open fracture with gross contamination and significant comminution. You could have an open fracture with a very small amount of contamination. You could have an open fracture with a patient who has a dysvascular limb, or you could have an open fracture with someone who's developing compartment syndrome. So, you know, to say in and of itself that an open fracture does not need urgent surgery, you know, we might be sending the wrong message. As Samir said, you have to individualize each case. And certainly, all things being equal with no um, limb-threatening emergencies or urgencies going on, you know, I don't see a problem in waiting for you know, the, the most uh, qualified, well-trained team to be available. And if that's first thing the next morning, you know, that's, that's not really a problem. We've, we've gone away from, uh, in our institution, operating in the middle of the night just for, you know, operating, uh, operating uh, sake uh, because we also have trauma rooms available at our, at our trauma centers. And, uh, you know, I think this has made a big difference uh, not only for the patients but for the staff in, uh, in fracture surgeons being able to continue on uh, and uh, being able to care for these people long, long into their careers. So, folks, um, uh, we still have a little more time, and I'd like to maybe put one more question to the uh, same question to the two of you, and I'll start with Ken. Um, if time to initial debridement is not an issue, uh, some have suggested that complex open fractures should be transferred to a higher-level trauma facility even prior to the initial debridement. Uh, do you support this? Again, um, I think as a general concept, um, these patients should be treated by people who have expertise in their care. Uh, if, it's, uh, if it happens that the patient arrives at a destination where the, that care is not available um, and there are no limb-threatening emergencies, um, then I think certainly uh, a patient could be transferred to a high level of care. However, I wouldn't want people to use this type of paper as an excuse for you know, shirking their responsibility, uh, uh, you know, as an on-call physician and contract with society and taking care of, uh, you know, our injured uh, patient population. So uh, I think not for convenience sake, but certainly for complexity's sake, uh, it certainly should be considered. So, Samir, could you quickly weigh in on this? Uh, do you support uh, the transfer of these more complex injuries to a higher level uh, uh, facility? I, I I would agree with Ken. I think it it, man, it, it really depends on um, what resources and you have available at your institution and what your comfort level is in managing these patients uh, uh, initially. We do know that the initial debridement uh, has a, a, a significant impact on the overall outcome that's been published before as well. And so I, I think you have to really take stock of um, your interest and your abilities to, to, to manage these patients when they first arrive. Uh, and so I, I, don't ha I don't have an issue with patients being transferred uh, prior to their initial debridement if that's what's in the best interest of the patient. Okay, so um, I thank you both. And we'll now move on to our next author, Dr. Romney Anderson, who's going to present his paper. Thanks, Ron, and thanks to uh, JBGS for uh, having me. Uh, I'll be talking today about uh, the treatment of proximal 
femur fractures uh, that were open, sustained in combat. <clears throat> so these uh, obviously are rare injuries. They're seen more frequently in a combat setting or a terrorist-type setting. They usually have significantly high mechanisms of injuries and have high complication rates. And uh, on the right side of my slides, you'll see pictures of the uh, either e initial injuries or in their uh, treatment process. Uh, so our purpose of the study was to look at the overall results of these injuries, uh, identifying the mechanism of injuries, the type of fracture, time to union, reoperation rates, infection rates, and symptomatic heterotopic ossification rates. Uh, we did a retrospective review of patients we saw over a five-year period of time from 2003 to 2008 at the Walter Reed uh, Army Medical Center and the National Naval Medical Center, which ultimately combined to become the Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. Uh, we saw 41 type 3 fractures, um, and we used descriptive statistics. Uh, the demographics, the mean age of our patients was 25.7 years with a range of 20 to 29. Uh, sex was predominantly men with 39 and two women. Uh, our mechanism of injury, 29 were due to blast, 29 were due to blast injuries, eight to gunshot wounds, three to high, uh, high energy motor vehicle crashes, and one a helicopter crash. The uh, type fractures we had were 30 type uh, A, six type B, and five type C. The uh, AO OTA classifications, uh, if you look towards the bottom of the screen, predominated, uh, were, were predominantly the higher mechanisms of injury. Uh, there was a lot of associated injuries, as you can imagine, 73% uh, uh, chest, head, or abdomen uh, injuries, ipsilateral fractures in 37% of the patients, and that would either be in the pelvis, the distal femur, or in the tibia. Uh, Thirty-four percent of these patients had nerve injuries in the distribution shown below. Interestingly, uh, they were mostly very high energy injuries and we only had one recovery of, of a nerve injury in that group uh, of 34 percent of the patients that had a nerve injury. Uh, vascular injury, or the three C fractures, all five of five three C fractures had a, success, had a successful repair or reconstruction of the uh, artery. Uh, of the three B fractures, <coughs> nine had uh, flaps, two uh, biceps femoris, one vastus lateralis, one sartorius, one cross leg, uh, one, three rectus abdominis, and uh, one latissimus dorsi. The picture on the right there is of a rectus abdominis flap going down to uh, fill in. You can see the lateral side of the nail after it was placed there. Uh, the mean evacuation time from theater <coughs> was uh, about six days, uh, ranged from two to 25. Uh, irrigation and debridement procedures prior to evacuation averaged 2.7, ranging from one to six. Uh, IND on the uh, state side, there were 3.2 on average between 1 and 12. Uh, antibiotics were maintained until the wounds were covered. Uh, Pre-op cultures done at the time of injury in theater uh, were done in 85% of the patients. 21 of these were positive, or 60% had positive cultures. Uh, definitive fracture fixation occurred in 12.3 days uh, and ranged from 0 to 31 days. And the patients averaged uh, 10.3 surgeries or anywhere from 2 to 34 surgeries. We had two-year follow-up on 95% of these patients, or 39 of 41 of the patients. The mean follow-up average was 56.5 months, and it ranged from 24 months to 84 months. Initial provisional stabilization was uh, external fixation in 39 of the uh, 41 patients. They were uh, 17, were spanning the pelvis, uh, 22 were only in the femur. One was skeletal traction and one patient had immediate uh, fixation in theater. Uh, ultimately, the definitive fixation 
uh, cephalomedullary nail in 83% of the patients, proximal femoral locking plate in 5% of the patients, spanning X fix was uh, used for definitive treatment in 5% of the patients, cannulated screws in 2% of the patients, hip fusion in one patient, and hip disarticulation in one patient. Mean time to union uh, was five months. It ranged from 2.8 to 16. And associated amputations, there were 12 of them, or about a third uh, were had amputations proximal to the ankle. We did not look at the toe or midfoot amputations. Complications, uh, reoperation rate of 74%. Uh, these were mostly due to infections. Type 3A fractures had an 18% infection rate. Type 3B fractures had a 67% infection rate. And a type 3C fractures had 60% uh, infection rates. Uh, we saw that uh, the type A significantly ha or had significantly less decreased infections as you compare those to the three Bs and the three Cs. Uh, and of those that had initial negative wound cultures, they were 93% uh, negative predictive value. The positive uh, wound cultures, however, only had a 52% positive predictive value of infection. Uh, complications, uh, if you had an infection, you had an average of 17.2 trips to the operating room. If you didn't have an infection, you had an average of 7.4 trips to the operating room. <laughs> infection increased uh, the time to union by 1.9 months. And intramedullary nail removal was required in 15% of our patients. So our conclusions were uh, severe, uh, these are severe injuries with associated major trauma, high rates of complication, high rates of con concomitant injuries, ipsilateral fractures, ipsilateral nerve injuries with low recovery rates, ipsilateral amputations. We see similar rates of union to uh, civilian injuries. Uh, negative cultures are useful, po positive cultures not so uh, infection significantly increases the number of operating room encounters, and cephalomedullary nail fixation can be a successful method of treating these uh, difficult fractures. Thanks, Romney. Now Dr. Michael Bossy will hi share his perspective on um, your presentation. Well, thanks, Ron, and good evening, everybody. Um, I think uh, Romney uh, presented a, a, a paper that is uh, important and, and uh, critical to the uh, time that we live. Um, this was a retrospective descriptive study of 41 type 3 combat proximal femur fractures. These are typically uncommon in civilian care, but given the uptick in civilian bomb events, understanding the concepts of care and the value of a cephalomedullary nail for these injuries is important. And I think it might be interesting to, to also consider now in contrast to the prior paper that discusses the acceptability to delays in surgery, typically with low-grade civilian fractures, that I think most of us uh, would agree and argue that uh, these patients are likely fit into an urgent uh, care category. The uh, principles of care of the high energy uh, fracture with, extent, with an extensive zone of injury is, is uh, cr critical and must be um, uh, uh, recognized and adhered to in care of these patients. The wounds are extended to allow for complete exposure of the injured area. Provisional ex uh, external fixation provides reasonable stability. Perfusion needs to be restored or maintained. When the wound bed is stable, conversion to a nail is safe, and the wound is covered when the tissue is finally allowed. Uh, as we saw in, in the uh, presentation, both the surgeon and the uh, family need to anticipate a high uh, complication rate. Provisional external fix fixation was used in 39 of the 41 patients, 17 of those were hip-spanning span external fixators, all were, were performed with, without uh, major complications. The patients averaged six debris months prior to nail conversion, and the time to conversion was 12 days from the initial injury. All conversions were single stage, that is the external fixator, fixator was removed and the nail was placed at the same procedure. Of interest, <clears throat> there was only one non-union in, in this series. 34% of the patients had associated major nerve injuries, and 19% of 3A and 63% of 3B and C fractures developed uh, infection. Uh, 
11 of the 12 infections were gram negative. The authors thought this might be related to the severity of the trauma, the high degree of contamination, uh, and or the proximity of the wounds to the patient's perineal region and anus uh, throughout the care. But maybe times are changing, and maybe gram negative infections are a feature of modern high energy trauma that we need to recognize and address. In the 2015 OTA, uh, at the 2015 OTA meeting, uh, the metric team reported the results from a prospective bioburden study of type 3 tibia fractures of 61 patients with subsequent positive cultures at later revision surgeries. 50% of the cultures were uh, gram negative, with Enterobacter and Enterococcus be the, being the predominant organisms. So in, in uh, uh, summation, uh, delayed cephalomegin nails appear to be a good option for combat-like injuries to the proximal uh, femur. Infection, heterotop diversification, nerve injuries are factors that impact recovery and final outcome. And gram-negative infection risks need to be anticipated and perhaps proactively addressed. Thanks. So Michael, thank you for your commentary. Um, we have a few minutes, so before we move on to the open question and answer section of the webinar, um, I have a question for Romney and perhaps one for Michael, again, if time permits. Uh, Romney, the patients in your study were fit, motivated, had exceptionally strong support mechanisms. How do your findings translate to the treatment of our civilian population? Well, we've, uh, I, I've only seen a couple uh, similar type injuries in the, in the couple of years since I've gotten out of the military. These have been in uh, patients that are very different from the patients that we saw in the military. In the military, one could kind of argue that these guys are semi-pro athletes. They're out running every day. They're eating healthily. They're, to, to even be where they're at, they have to be at a certain level of fitness and, and, and health. Uh, certainly some of these uh, in the civilian sector uh, aren't that way. They come uh, either from uh, drug backgrounds or very uh, unusual circumstances to obtain these injuries. And I've tried on one occasion to, to, to salvage a limb like this that just did not, uh, did not occur. Um, and we ended up going on to an amputation, um, primarily because going through surgeries was uh, very dangerous for him because he was in the unit not doing well. But it, you really have to look at the patient and, and see if a patient can undergo and sustain long-term treatment uh, that these patients uh, undergo with the numerous trips to the operating room and uh, numerous irrigation debridements and very high complication rates. So, so Michael, in, in these very severe uh, blast and or high energy injuries, uh, when should a clinician recommend or consider immediate amputation versus limb salvage? Um, also, during limb salvage, what should determine the frequency of the breedment and or the need to reconsider amputation? I think the first question is that if you can't establish or maintain perfusion and the distal extremity is ischemic and remains that way, then amputation is the only option. Um, I think that unlike the limb salvage decision make or limb salvage versus amputation uh, a question that we, uh, we uh, you know, struggle with in the lower extremity where we're looking at, at in most cases, a below the knee amputation and sometimes a, you know, a distal femoral uh, uh, or transfemoral amputation. Uh, patients with, with the injury we're describing now, uh, if they're in, uh, amputated through the uh, zone of injury, they're essentially high non-functional uh, transfemorals or, or hip disarticulations. So I think that in uh, you know, trying to decide the, the avenue we're going to take with these patients, um, we probably lean towards limb salvage um, because the, uh, the option of the amputation is uh, not that functional and probably more, disabil uh, uh, more debilitating. I think that um, the number of debridements, the uh, number of complications uh, that we're willing to, um, to reform or accept is patient-dependent. Um, if the injury and in the reconstructive process ever becomes life-threatening, then obviously it ends. If the patient is, you know, getting the minor complications that we see along the way, infections, perhaps a non-union needs an ex exchange nail, or you know, the, the, the expectations that we see with treating these uh, the kind of these kind of injuries, I think 
we just deal with those and, and try to work the patient through it. Um, I would tend to be more aggressive towards limb salvage with this injury than I would be to amputation, only because the amputation is be such a miserable fit. Right. So I, I want to thank everybody for uh, uh, these great insights. Um, and I see we have a lot of questions. So um, uh, we're going to start the Q&A portion of this event and uh, attempt to address some of these. And I'm going to try my best to spread the wealth, if you will. And um, the first question I'm going to direct to Romney. Um, and it is, what do you mean by gross debridement in the ED? Is this pouring some saline over the wound, pulling out foreign bodies with a hemostat? And what about anesthesia in such an attempt? Uh, an was that anesthesia in a tent? Uh, in such an, by anesthesia, what, what are the implications of the lack of anesthesia in doing this in, uh, in an emergency department? Uh, that's not something that we do at our facility. Um, we get to these uh, usually the next morning. Um, if there is truly gross contamination like a barnyard injury or you've got grass and, and uh, dirt in the wound, um, which most open fractures don't have, we'll actually bring them to the operating room in, in the night. We don't uh, pull out bone fragments in the ER. We don't uh, spritz them with uh, saline. If, if they've got a true contaminated wound, we'll, we'll bring them to the operating room in, in, in the middle of the night. If, if it's a relatively stable open fracture, they'll get the betadine dressing placed over it and some type of traction or splinting, depending on where the fracture is, and then uh, brought to the operating room, uh, try and push it to one of our first two cases the next morning. Okay, and I'm, I'm not going to rush, folks, but we have so many, uh, I think, very um, intriguing questions. I'm going to try to see if we can move along. Uh, uh, Samir. If there was no difference in the infection rate between early and late debridement, was there any difference in the infection rate between early and late administration of antibiotics? So, um, Ron, we didn't actually look at this question specifically. Uh, part of the reason that we did not uh, was that uh, some of the manuscripts actually didn't indicate uh, uh, when they gave the antibiotics, um, but there's fairly strong evidence that suggests that early antibiotic administration is therapeutic in terms of uh, preventing uh, infection. So uh, while our study didn't look at that, I think there, part of the reason we didn't look at that was that many of the studies that were included administered early antibiotics and didn't even go into when they were administered because it was quote unquote early, if you know what I mean. Okay. Um, so uh, an another um, uh, Intriguing question, uh, and I'll direct this to Ken. If a patient presents to the ER with a less than one centimeter laceration, clean, gross, no soft tissue contamination, no exposed bone, can this be irrigated in the emergency room, loosely reapproximated, antibiotics provided, and the extremity splinted? Is this uh, considered careless medicine? So I think you have to. <clears throat> You know, look at again. You have to look at the injury. Is this a laceration uh, in the area of a fracture? Did the patient, you know, break their leg and fall and cut the skin over the area of fracture, or was this truly an open fracture where the breakage of the bone caused stripping and poked out of the uh, out of the skin from inside out? I think those two situations are completely different. Uh, both are contaminated situations, but obviously the, the real open fracture, the one that's caused uh, from inside to out, is the more serious one. Um, in my, our practice, we, we tend to uh, manage any open wound in the area of a fracture um, surgically, uh, you know, as long as the patient, uh, you know, can go to the OR. And, uh, but it's certainly nothing that, that would be an emergency. It's okay. something that could wait and, and be done uh, on a semi-elective basis, I think. Okay. So, um, Ken, I'm sorry, Ron, I have a question for Ken, actually. Ken, and ad geography... Identify yourself for the webinar oh. world. Sorry, it's Samir again. Okay. Ken, does, does the location of the laceration have an impact? I mean, if this were over, say, a distal radius versus over a tibia versus over a midfoot, would that change your decision-making at all? Uh, 
Not really. Uh, I, we, we tend to, to take all uh, open wounds that are around the fractures to the OR. Uh, even if we're not going to fix the fracture, like in the case of some foot fractures, uh, we think uh, you, know, you can do a little bit more of an extensive cleanup in the OR and, and, and close it more appropriately. Uh, you know, you're able to explore a wound with a patient under anesthesia. Um, again, nothing that needs to be done in the middle of the night, but you know, in our practice, we tend to take these to the OR. So, um, Michael, in general, are antibiotics continuation recommended after 24 or 48 hours? I, at, at this point in time, they're not. Uh, I think most of us use just the, you know, the term prophylactic antibiotics for a short course. Um, I think in the uh, high-grade fractures, uh, we need to rethink how we're caring for these patients. And uh, with the, um, the highly contaminated the grade 3D fractures or tape 3D fractures, you know, at the time of final closure or flapping, the, the wounds were often uh, culture positive. And, and I think that uh, an evolving strategy might be to determine what the host or bio burden is and then address that bio burden for a course that we would give any patient who comes in the emergency room with a contaminated or, light, or low, low grade infected wound. And uh, we're starting to give uh, seven to 10 days of antibiotics uh, for the dominant organism at the time of uh, a flapping now. Okay. And um, I, I have a question for that I'm going to throw out to the entire group and just identify yourself as you answer. Um, uh, do any of the participants have alternate criteria to treat open fractures in children? Who wants to take a stab at it? I can see we have no one, no pediatric orthopedic surgeons in the group here. So um, perhaps I'll move on. Um, uh, does it remain a standard of care that open fractures with exposed bone are not reduced until after debridement? And I'm going to give that to Romney. Um, I, I think it depends on what you have, and, and certainly we hear that a lot, but if, if there's somebody with a, a 45 or 90 degree angulated open tibia fracture in the ER, I'm unlikely going to tell the ER to splint that at 90 degrees and, and, and wait until we get to the operating room. Almost all the time we try and reduce that if, <clears throat> before we get them off to the operating room. Um, so I, I think my ultimate answer would have to be no, I, I, I don't agree with that. And we frequently reduce open fractures okay. uh, prior, prior to their ultimate definitive irrigation and debridement. So um, Samir, I have another question that comes up very frequently. What about closing the small wounds? And I assume that they mean uh, primary closure of the lower grade injuries. So, um, in the setting of an adequate debridement, I'm actually I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm actually very uh, keen on trying to get primary wound closure, uh, especially if I've placed definitive stabilization as well. So, for example, that type one or type two or even type three A open tibia fracture, if I've gone ahead and I've gotten an adequate debridement, um, I, it was a say, relatively clean wound. I've gone ahead and and, and placed uh, hardware plate or nail of some sort, um, I, I'm a, I am a proponent of primary wound closure when possible. Uh, I like to have a biologic dressing, uh, if you will, over my uh, soft tissue, a bone, and, and metal. Um, in a setting of, in situations where maybe I haven't definitively stabilized the fracture, but I have placed the patient in an external fixation, so I'm having some uh, stability to the limb, uh, again, if I can get a primary wound closure um, but still do an adequate debridement of the deeper soft tissue, uh, I, I do prefer that. I, I don't hesitate, though, to take that patient back to the operating room if I have concerns about uh, the quality of the debridement performed or the, the uh, contamination at the time of the injury to go back and repeat that same debridement 24, 48, 72 hours later, uh, particularly if there's issues or concerns about the wound. Okay. So, uh, Ron, this is, this is Mike. Um, right. Just to, to, to add on to that, the, the OTA actually sponsored a uh, prospective randomized study years back uh, looking at the, the immediate versus delayed closure 
of uh, uh, type uh, 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 2 and 3A tibia fractures that were deemed adequately debrided and closable at the, time, at the end of the procedure. They were randomized. And at the end of the study, the infection rate for both groups was the same. It was like 8.5% versus 9.2%. Um, it was a very underpowered study. There were only like 250 patients in each arm. The final power analysis showed you'd have to have 1,200, so therefore the project's not doable. Um, but it was pretty interesting information. So what's your approach in your practice now, Mark? Uh, we close all wounds uh, that we can. Okay. So we clean them and, and close them. If we're worried about it, we'll clean it and close it and come back. If we're not worried about it, we don't come back again. Okay. Um, I have a question that uh, looks to be directed to uh, Dr. Agle. Um, it says in regards to Dr. Agle's point, what is the evidence that a, quote, clean laceration versus traumatic protrusion of a fracture fragment have different outcomes? I'm not aware that this has been studied. Yeah, I would agree with that. I don't think there's any, uh, there is no evidence. Um, you know, I just, uh, you know, again, it's our, our collective personal practice uh, where we, uh, you know, where we practice in our community. Um, you know, we think it's good medicine. Uh, I've never been sorry that I've washed out a wound. And I've seen a number, I practice in a large urban community where people practice different ways, and I've seen a number of, quote, unquote, you know, open fractures that were, ER debrided and casted come in draining pus. Okay. So I don't know that anything would have changed that outcome, but certainly you, you couldn't fault someone for taking them to the OR to clean it up. All right. Hey, Ken, Ken this is Romney. I'd, I'd like to make one more point with that. I think we've all seen fractures <clears throat> that look like they're relatively well reduced when we see the initial x-ray when we see it. And then we get them to the operating room and realize that even though there may be a very small laceration on the skin, that there's really no stability to the bone and there's been a lot of soft tissue stripping. And, it, and, and you may, it, although it may have looked like a small laceration at first, it was likely an open fracture. All right. Well, that's the, and, that's, and again, that's also part of the fallacy of the, of the classification. You could have a very small wound. And it doesn't really tell you anything about the energy of the fracture. So if you see a highly comminuted fracture and a little pinhole, that's still a high-grade open fracture, right? It's about the energy that's imparted to the limb, not the size of the open wound, really. And if you, it's, you really stage these things after the debridement. So let me be the contrarian here. This is Mike. So you know, when, you, when you present this topic to the guys in the state of Texas, they laugh at you because they say you can, you can, um, you can take uh, gunshot wounds, that have comminution, and you can treat the tibia fracture, or metaphyseal fracture, in a cast, wash it out in the ER, give it some antibiotics, and send it home, and never have to debride it, and we advocate for that. And then you take a non-gunshot wound, and you say you have to take it to the OR, and they question, you know, what's the validity of that thought process? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I have um, another very interesting question, and I'm going to direct this to Romney. Um, what do you think is the role, Romney, of uh, wound vax in the management of open fractures, the acute management? Well, it, certainly when we were treating uh, a large number of wounds with a limited, uh, with limited resources, it certainly <clears throat> helps out in keeping the wounds managed. Uh, there is some concern that uh, the negative pressure wound therapy potentially sucks some of the contents of the intramedullary canal out and contributes to heterotopic ossification. I, I don't have any scientific evidence of that, but certainly a lot of people talk about that. But it was but something that you used liberally uh, very for li Okay. Very liberally because it, 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 it covered the wound. You didn't have to have people going up doing changes of the dressings, um, and it, it, it helped take out a lot of the excess fluid in the tissues as well. Okay, and um, uh, moving on down the line here, uh, Samir, um, uh, what is the, uh, your medical legal point of view uh, as far as recommending the timing of open fractures? Uh, is there um, a, a medical legal uh, risk um, in, in the delay, or what's your position with that? Uh, that's a that's a great question, and uh, I live uh, in Philadelphia, uh, which is a particularly uh, unique uh, region when it comes to medical legal, um, the medical legal world. 
Um, again, I, I think the arbitrary number of six hours is probably irrelevant. Um, I think what's more important, and I think uh, Ken made this point earlier, I think much more important is what's the character of the fracture, and that takes into account several things. It takes into account the gross contamination, the mechanism of injury, the location of the fracture, uh, i.e. tibia, femur, humerus, uh, the condition of the patient, um, the resources available at the hospital, the person doing the debris mod, um, the additional injuries that the patient might have. Did they receive their antibiotics in a timely fashion? And I'm hard pressed to say that that number should be two hours or four hours or six hours. I think for a clean type one open tibia that comes in at six or seven or eight o'clock at night, that could be first case the next day. Um, a grossly contaminated type 3B open tibia with, uh, you know, road debris and grease and gravel in the wound, that, in my opinion, should go at, you know, at, upon arrival kind of thing. Or sooner the better, if you will, if the patient is stable. That's my opinion, but I also think it's the right thing to do for the patient. And so ultimately, I, 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 I don't think I'm answering the question for saying giving you a definitive time, right. but I think that you have to do what's right for the patient. But I think so what you're doing, uh, oh, you go, Michael. You go. I was going to say, for the medical legal side, what, what I use is the uh, the data we got from the, the LEAP study, and, uh, and I, I quote this to the attorneys, is that in a study of uh, 600 patients with type 3 uh, A and B tibia fractures, uh, to be in the study had to be uh, debris within the first 24 hours, and there was no difference with any of the parameters we looked at, contamination, the degree of soft tissue injury, the severity of the, uh, the, the fracture, um, it, as long as you had your debris in the first uh, 24 hours, whether it was 6 hours, 12 hours, or 24 hours, the, the infection rates were no different. Okay, so um, uh, does anyone on the panel have experience in using local vancomycin powder for open fractures? And again, identify yourself if you respond. And that's for anyone. Yeah, this is Mike. Uh, I, I use it on a regular basis. Anyone else? Uh, this is Romney. I use it on a regular basis as well. Okay. And um, uh, I'm going to stay with Mike. Um, what about um, your irrigation solution? Any, um, any uh, insight as far as cocktails, lidocaine, antibiotics, saline solution? Uh, what's your preference at, as we speak? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that, uh, that the pref the, what we used was uh, va uh, validated by the flow study. We used no antibiotics. We knew, knew, we knew no lidocaine. We simply used pressure gravity um, uh, uh, or uh, gravity pressure irrigation from the urology tubing, and, uh, and uh, we no, no longer use the water pick. We don't use bacitracin. We don't use betadine. We don't use soap. We just use plain saline water. Okay. Um, anyone else want to comment regarding irrigation? Ron, totally this is Romney. I use, I, use, I use the same thing. I'm sorry, this is Romney. I use the same thing, just gravity irrigation. Okay. No, no additives. Okay. And Ken? Yeah, I agree. I'm, uh, I'm in the same uh, saline boat as everybody else. Okay. So, um, Ken, um, a question about uh, tetanus. Um, because we've uh, not brought that up uh, uh, to this point, um, what's what's your 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 thoughts regarding tetanus in uh, in open fractures? Uh, well, you know, obviously it depends on the patient's uh, immune status. If there's a if there's a record, um, and they they know their status, and it's within five years, then they'll they'll just get uh, uh, the, the immunoglobin, and if, if if it's unknown, they get toxoid. So. Uh, everybody gets everybody gets uh, coverage uh, for that on, on arrival in our institution. Okay, so um, I, I probably have time for just one more question, and I'll put it out, and I'll have everyone respond. Um, uh, so, what are the empirical antibiotics that you give for an open fracture? And we'll start with Samir. So, uh, for our open fractures, for type open ones fracture. get yeah. For type ones, get uh, ANSEF. Uh, or cephalospor, you know, uh, uh, ANSEF type 2s, uh, get ANSEF, and <laughs> I hate saying this, but depending on uh, who is in the trauma bay or in the ER, 
you know, ER doctor or, or trauma surgeon, sometimes they might get a dose of Gent without us knowing. Um, but typically it's ANSEF, and the type 3s get ANSEF and Gent. And if there's obviously um, barnyard type contamination, ANSEF, Gent, and penicillin. All right, so folks, I apologize. Our time is running short. So what I'd like to do uh, before we close uh, with Dr. Swinkowski is I want to thank all of our speakers for their presentations and insights. I would like to thank you all for joining us. As you exit this webinar, please take a moment to fill out the short survey, which will help us evaluate this presentation as well as plan for future webinars. I hope you found this session valuable. I want to thank Dr. Lindsay and all the speakers for putting together tonight's webinar. As mentioned earlier, surgeons attending this live broadcast will be eligible to receive CME credit. An email will be sent out tomorrow at noon with further instructions. CME credit is only available for the live presentation and not for the archived version of this webinar. We hope that you enjoyed this presentation. This webinar will be archived for one year in the event that you or your colleagues would like to listen again. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night.